Kau lebih apa ini?
know what they told me? They said, yeah, preacher, and we'll have a button back here that will drop you out of the pulpit, too. So. <laughs> If you have your Bibles with you this morning, turn with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. As I was preparing for this message when I got back off of vacation, if you can call it moving vacation, the Lord just led me to this passage of Scripture in this verse 17. And I thought as I was going to sleep last night that, you know, it's time that we in the pulpits across America start telling what God's Word says. Not what some current event said or what not some uh, professor so-and-so said, but what thus saith the Lord. And when I look at this, I want you to pay close attention this morning as we develop the sermon. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Notice what it says. Therefore, if any man be in Christ. Notice that. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. There are four places that salvation leads us. There are three things in our lives that we experience. And once we experience these things, our lives will never, ever be the same again. That is, if you are sincere about things, your life will never, ever be the same ever again. And the first I thought to think about is marriage. You cannot take a mate and expect things to be the same as it was before marriage. <laughs> I found that out a long time ago. I can say most anything today because Donna's not here. <laughs> you okay, Brother Jerry, don't you be telling her. <laughs> Oh, I forgot about being on, on the video. <laughs> All right. You can take a mate. I thank God for mine. And never expect to be the same ever again. When we take marriage seriously as God intends for it to be taken... Those who enter into marriage will never again be the same. You know why? Because when we give, uh, give ourselves to someone in marriage, we are giving them the ultimate gift. And when marriage is taken seriously, those who think about it and realize and notice I'm saying this several times, you'll never, ever be the same, never, never again. I'm drilling that point into your minds. Marriage, if you think about it, marriage is a life-changing experience. But another life-changing experience is childbirth. I mean, when that little six or seven pound baby arrives in the home, that home will never, ever be the same again. I mean, that baby becomes the focus of all the attention. That little person determines the whole, and the whole family is going to sleep. That, that little baby determines when he's going to be fed. I mean, when he's hungry, if it's three o'clock in the morning, 
You're going to get up and you're going to feed him because he's hungry. That baby is in full control in the house and runs it pretty much the way that he wants to. Someone has described a baby as a digestive apparatus with a loud noise at one end and no responsibility at the other. <laughs> you can rest assured that when a person gets married and, and, and later gives birth to a baby, life is never, ever the same ever again. These are life-changing experiences. But there is one more life-changing experience that affects us more than the, the two that I have just mentioned. And it's the most life-changing uh, thing that could ever occur in anyone's life. That is when we sincerely experience conversion. Notice what the passage said. Once a person sincerely accepts Jesus Christ as his Savior... Listen to me, your life is never, ever the same ever again. Someone might say, well now, preacher, I know someone who claims to, to have accepted Christ and you cannot tell any difference in their lives whatsoever. Well, all of us know people like that. But you can claim all you want to claim, but that does not mean, folks, that their claim is true. Listen. What the Lord said about many who claim that people will make on judgment day. Matthew, listen to it. Matthew 7, 22 and 23. Listen to this. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then Jesus said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Notice the words. Many will say unto me in that day. There's no doubt about it. The Lord is not exaggerating. Churches, you can hear people saying this today. And I thought about this last night. I guess the reason why God called me to preach is He knows I'll say what He wants me to say, regardless of who it hits or what. And I've done that for 40 something years, down through the years. I've just said what God laid upon my heart. And Jesus is not exaggerating here uh, when He says this. And people are not exaggerating because, listen to me. The churches of America today are filled with people who are not saved. Amen. Billy Graham even says that. He said the church rolls is where the lost people are. And that's why I believe that God... Now, you can, now let me say this. You can know whether you're saved or not. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. I'm not trying to tell you you can't know because you can't. John says you can know that you are saved if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Our text verse says, therefore, he that is in Christ, those who know Christ as their personal Savior, are new creatures. I'm going to tell you something, folks. When Jesus straightened my life out, you can tell it. I was working at a good year time rubber company at that time, and and, and uh, I, had a, I lost my whole vocabulary. I had to learn to talk all over again. And I was standing there at my desk, and, and, and uh, as I came in from that revival service that night before, I came into my desk, and, and the men on the, on the line there that was inspecting tires, they told me later, they said, that we knew something was different about you when you came in this morning. You know how they knew it? I had to learn how to talk all over again. Every other word was a cuss word. But when Jesus Christ came into my life, He changed that, and now I became a new creature. Those old things passed away, and all things become new. The Bible teaches that something happens in the life of a person who accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. What is that, preacher? People who are saved are changed people. Listen, if a person claims to have had a life-changing experience but are still the same as they've always been, that person is letting you know that they've never been born again. 
I'd rather tell you that here than you stand before Jesus uh, on Judgment Day and you come before Him and He is re quoting chapter 7 of Matthew, I never knew you. And you're going to be glad that you heard the, the pastor say, uh, if you, you haven't had that life-changing experience, then you're not saved. People who are saved are changed people. Listen to, again to that text verse. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. That is, once a person is saved by the wonderful grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that person begins to walk down a, a new path. And in this sermon, I want to show you at least four places salvation leads us to. Now listen to this first one. Salvation leads to holiness. Salvation leads to holiness. You know, it never ceases to amaze me those who claim to be saved these days. For example, after a life of sin, Frank Sinatra died, and you know what they put in his casket? A filth bottle of Jack Daniels. And the message we heard from the Hollywood crowd was that heaven is going to be going to sound a whole lot nicer now since he is there to lead the heavenly choir. I don't think so. And I'm not going to mention any of the name of the other people in the entertainment business who have who's died because I want to uh, I want I want to show as much respect as I can to the dead. But let me tell you something. It bothers me greatly. And in order to, it should bother all of us greatly when we hear the false teaching that everyone dies and goes to heaven regardless of the wicked lives they live, regardless of the sin that's in their life. And I'm here to tell you that God's Word says that's not what I'm teaching. The Bible teaches just the opposite, that many are teaching that today. Listen to Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You know, you have to pay attention to what God's Word says. We see here the Bible emphatically teaches that without holiness, a man shall not see the Lord. Now, that's what the Bible says. That's not what Jackie Harris is saying. That's what the Bible says. Listen, there are not going to be any blind people in heaven. So that means if we claim to be saved by the grace of God, where in this was, where we're truly saved, our lives will reflect that we live a holy life after Jesus comes into our lives. The kind of salvation the Bible teaches leads us to the path of holiness. Anyone who believes that we can profess to be saved by the grace of God and still live in a life of sin is deceived. Is deceived. I'll back that up in the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. Listen. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of himself and mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's what God's Word says. And if the Apostle Paul were preaching today, in the church today, he would preach the same message that he preached to the Galatians, over in chapter 5, verses 19 through 26. Listen to Paul's message. Verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, adultery, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seductions, seditions, heresies, Indians, murders, drunkenness, revel reveling, reviling, reveling, and such like of thee, which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's what God's Word says. It's, we're coming to a point in time, folks, that we must start paying attention to what God's Word says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. 
If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. The Bible teaches that if we sincerely accept Jesus Christ as Savior, we will lead, it will lead us to a path of holiness. Then it won't stop there. Secondly, salvation leads to the harvest field. Now pay attention to what I'm saying here. There is a desire, a desire that comes into our heart when we give our lives to Jesus, a desire to tell what Jesus has done for us. If you'll go back to the time you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can know what I'm talking about. You know, I couldn't wait till I called my mother in Alabama uh, when, when I first got my life straightened out with the Lord. I couldn't wait till I called her and say, Mother, you don't have to worry about me anymore. Uh, Jesus has saved me. And, I, you know, I thought maybe my heart was going to burst because I wanted to tell somebody what Jesus had done. People who have been truly saved and have seen themselves on the brink of hell, but the Lord Jesus marvelously and gracefully saved them. Once they have experienced this kind of salvation, they naturally want to tell the family and their friends and other relatives how they can be saved also. If you are in Christ Jesus, you're a new creature, and being a new creature, you're going to look out to the harvest field, you're going to see your family that's lost, you're going to see your friends that's lost, you're going to see your fellow law workers that's lost, and you're going to have a desire, if you're truly saved, to tell that person about the Lord Jesus Christ. Since the greatest thing to experience in life is eternal salvation, once we receive that salvation, we want to share the good news with someone else. You say, well, Brother Jackie, I, I can't do that. I, I'm not like you. I can't sit down and talk to somebody. Well, you know what? God doesn't expect you to do it by yourself. Listen to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Spirit Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. What did he say? Ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. In other words, those who are truly saved recognize that they have something wonderful to share with those who do not know Christ. You see, when he asked you to go into the harvest field, he said, I'll give you the power to talk to people. You can't go on your own. I never will forget years ago, I was out visiting one Thursday evening, and uh, I went into this house, and these people had visited the church where I was pastoring. And I walked into that house, and I have a, a little Bible back there that I call my witnessing Bible. It's just about this big, but it's the whole Bible. And I had it in my hand. And those people began to question me from Genesis to Revelation. And I'm not bragging about it because it wasn't me that did it. Every time they asked me a question in the New Testament, I turned right to it. Every time they asked me a question in the Old Testament, I turned right to it. I was amazed at myself that I was able to turn right to those passages of Scripture. And the reason I was is because the Holy Spirit of God was giving me the power to answer those folks' questions. And you know what they did that next Sunday? They came and moved their membership into the church where I was pastor. And you know what they said? We questioned you the other night. And you turned right as quick as we asked the question right to those passages of Scripture. That's why we want to join this church. I couldn't have done it on my own, folks. The Holy Spirit did it. The path of salvation leads us to holiness, leads us to the harvest field, but thirdly, salvation leads us to the house of God. You know what's sad? We have thousands of folks all across this country whose names are on the church roll, who claim that they're saved, but you can't keep them in church on a consistent basis. They will use the least thing that pops in their mind for an excuse not to attend church. 
You see, when I look at that, I, I like to say, they still have that old rebellious, sinful nature that wants to sin and associate with the ungodly rather than being in God's house on Sunday morning and Sunday night and so associating with godly people. This is not the way that true born-again believers behave. When people are born again, that old nature that hated to go to church, that always looking for an excuse not to go, was crucified when you gave your life to Jesus and He said, Behold, everything is made new. Now, they have a desire to go when it's time to worship the Heavenly Father. They love. But at last, but last of all, the Bible salvation does something else. I thought about this third point last night, and I said, well, you've got people that's going to be in church worshiping, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you get the gist of what God is telling us. Then fourthly and lastly, salvation leads to heaven. <laughs> leads to heaven. Remember the old song, Give Me That Old Time Religion? Good enough for Paul and Silas, it's good enough for me. Well, that's not how it's written. It has a verse that says, it will take you to heaven. We have very few people today who can actually say they have placed their feet upon the moon. And these people are a special group of people that have done this. But listen to me. One day the Lord Jesus Christ who saved us by His marvelous grace is going to rapture His church and take us all to heaven. Then we will be the most special group of people who ever existed. I thought about this and I was, looking, I was thinking about First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and, and it says that when Christ comes in the air, what does it say? Be, the, the dead that have died in Christ will be, will be raised first. I mean these old graveyards that you drive by every day are going to explode that day. When Jesus comes in the air and those old saints of God are going to come up out of that grave and they're going to soar into the heavens to meet Jesus there in the air and they're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye and to be in the likeness of Jesus. And, and if you and I will be walking around when that happens, it says He's going to reach down and going to take us up and He's going to change us in the twinkling of an eye and we'll be just like Him and we'll be, be all of our, our saints of God who died first and they rose first and then we come up in the rapture and He says, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Listen, folks, that's comfort to me to know that if when Jesus does come, I'm going to be in that group whether I'm dead or whether I'm alive. Amen. I'm going to be in that group. We're going to soar past Mars. I, don't, I thought about this last night and I thought, Jackie, you're not going to get the, uh, the, uh, the uh, what am I trying to think? The planet's in order, but going to soar past Mars, Mer Mer Mercury, whatever, Saturn, I don't know what that thing is. Pluto, all the way to the, to the end. And what are we going to do? When we soar in there with Jesus, we're going to hear that heavenly choir singing when we all get to heaven. <laughs> oh, what a glorious day that's going to be. Can you say that this morning? If Jesus Christ came back in this very next hour, would you be taken or would you be left? Let me close by saying this. The Bible says very little about this marvelous place. You ever wonder why? Why Jesus didn't say that much about heaven? Well, it's because heaven is such a marvelous place that if God described more of it to us, we would not be able to comprehend what He's talking about. Actually, we don't comprehend what He does give us. For example, Listen to this glorious description given us in Revelation chapter 21, verse 20. So listen to this. And there shall in no wise enter into it any that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb book of life. We're going to go to a place where there's no sin, where nothing can enter in there that's going to 
Tear heaven up. You know what? If God, and like some people teach today, we're all, I, I noticed on Facebook, which they say, well, we're all children of God. No, we're not. We're not all children of God. You, you are a, you, God did create you, but you're not a child of God until you come to Jesus Christ and He makes you a new creature and those old things have passed away and all things have become new. Then you are a child of God. But there's people say, well, we're all children of God. We're going to all go to heaven. No matter what you, the way you live your life, those people are going to be fooled on Judgment Day. I was thinking I'm going to close. Revelation tells us the books are going to be open, and other books are going to be open, and then the the book of the Lamb's Book of Life is going to be open, and the Lord Jesus is going to go down when you come before Him. Down, 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 the book of life. And if your name is not written there, no hope. If your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, you are not going to spend eternity with Jesus. It must be written there in the Lamb's book of life. Is it written there? You see, you might be thinking today, well, preacher, what are you preaching? You're preaching to the choir this morning. Maybe I am. But why did God say, Jackie Harris, turn to 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17? Tell them what I'm telling you. And I'm going to tell you some folks, it's about time that preacher gets some backbone about them and begin to teach what this word says, regardless of what people think about it. That's what Satan wants the preachers to do. But what God wants us to do is to preach this word just exactly like he says it and do not back up from it. Do not water it down. And that's what I'm going to do. That's what I've always done. Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? I'm going to give an invitation. You know whether you are or not. You know whether it's written there or not. If you're not, come down here and I'll show you. Or I'll get Brother Charles to show you. I'll have someone else to show you. How to come to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior. Father God, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this message. Holy Spirit, God, thank you for the words that you have placed in my mouth, upon my mind. And Lord, just burn this passage of Scripture in our hearts and our minds. Therefore, he that is in Christ is a new creature. Hold all things become new. Lord, I pray that each one of us will search our hearts and our lives today and check it and see whether we have truly come to know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Those who have, Lord, they know that right now. Just as I know that. Holy Spirit, God, those that do not, I pray that you just convict them right now. Prick their hearts. Those who have never given their life to Jesus, Lord, that they would come and say, Brother Jackie, I want to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. and I've asked Him to forgive me of my sins and come into my life. And I want to come before the congregation, as He says in His Word, and make my profession public. And I want to follow Jesus in baptism. Holy Spirit, God, move upon those that they would come during this invitation. There might be a child of God here today, Lord, that might want to come and say, Brother Jack, I just want to recommit my life to Jesus. I know I'm saved. I know that when I came to Him uh, years ago, he, he forgave me of my sins, but I want to recommit my life and do more for Him tomorrow than I have done yesterday. If there's someone who needs to move membership, Lord, Holy Spirit, God, move on that individuals, those individuals who need to move right here in Fairview Baptist Church. Lord, I know you have some great things in store for Fairview. You're sending us people from uh, each Sunday, young people, middle-aged people. Lord, to come and help us further the cause of Christ here in this place. So Holy Spirit, as Brother uh, Buddy gives the invitation and Miss Rachel plays, I pray on the very first stanza, those who need to make decisions this morning will come making those decisions on this very first word of this hymn of invitation.
And Lord, I'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it all because you're the only one worthy to receive it. It's in Jesus' most holy and precious name that I pray. Amen.